fact is the uh, statements concerning uh, in this article that was re- republished by another website, um, false Christology, a.k.a. canonic Jesus. And it says, James White seems to have no problem with Brown's false Christ. Uh, because I had written all aspects of Christology, check. It says, really, Dr. White? So do you, like Dr. Brown, deny that Jesus gave up his divinity to become fully man so you, just like Jesus, can do miracles under the power of the Holy Spirit? This is the false canonic Christ which Brown believes. This hey, can, is the... can, I, can I just say one thing? She, sure. Wh- whoever, whoever wrote that either is lying blatantly or is 100% misinformed. And, and I, I just want to challenge anyone that's listening and you're critical— do you take it lightly to bear false witness against your brother and a leader in the body? Do you, do you take it lightly to, to repeat things that are blatant falsehoods about someone, that there is not one syllable in my entire life of 46 plus years in the Lord, thousands of messages, teaching, preaching, that says that Jesus gave up his divinity? Well, here, not, not, uh, not, not a syllable. But he, does that but here's, disturb here's anyone the, that they bear false witness? Here's the quotes. Uh, and, and this is what it, I wanted to do, because this is educational. This is, yeah. this, this is I, I hope people will be able to see, this is not how you misrepresent someone, even if they don't believe you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, you're supposed to be truthful, even when you're representing non-Christians. That's, yep. that's the thing that's scary about so many of these folks that are still doing the Twitter storm out there. It, it says... This is the false NAR uh, Christ, Michael Brown confesses, espousing the typical NAR cult litany that comes with the territory. He teaches, quote, Jesus was declared Son of God with his resurrection, so he was born the Son of God and then born again as the Son of God. You've got to listen to the whole teaching, end quote. Now, I, I don't see what the source is, but it has quotations around it. Um, yeah, it's when Bill Johnson was on my radio show. Okay. People say that Bill Johnson taught that Jesus had to be born again, and they play a little clip saying, you see, Jesus was born again. So I asked Bill, that's not me, that's Bill being quoted there, okay? okay. Bill Johnson said, Jesus was born the Son of God, but then it says in Scripture that he was declared the Son of God with his resurrection. So he was, in that sense, born again. As far as I know, Bill does not believe the what's a heretical word of faith teaching in some word of faith circles that Jesus died in hell, that, right. he, that he literally became demonized, died in hell, became sin, and then was born again as a glorified man. That's a heretical belief that I, I categorically reject. And I believe Bill rejects that as well. So that was Bill explaining what he believed on my radio show. I see. And, and it's, it's being put on my lips as if those were my words. I mean, again, it's, it's either malicious or real, real bad uh, scholarship. Okay, here's the second quote. Jesus always was fully God, but like many others teach, while he was on earth, he did not use his, use his divine prerogatives to heal, but heal, heal, it's misspelled, heal by the Spirit. Jesus himself says that I can only do what I see the Father doing. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach. I drive out demons by the Spirit. Now, I'm trying to figure out what's heretical about that. Yeah, as far as I know, that's biblical scholarship. As far as I can tell. For example, Jesus didn't work, even though Jesus could have done anything, Jesus could have spoken nine trillion languages in the womb, Right. but he took on human form. and I don't think he was making believe when he said, goo, goo, gaga, you know, or when he was, when he was, trying to crawl. I don't think he was making believe doing that. And instead he could have flown around the world. He took on human limitations. That's why he got tired. That's why he had to eat and drink and things like that. And at the same time, he, even though he had by his divinity, he could have evoked any miracle at any point or called down angels to rescue him from the cross, as he said, that he said that he drove out demons by the spirit. By the spirit. So we emphasize, even though the spirit was on him without measure, and it's only given to us in measure that the same spirit was on him as the same spirit that is in us. And by that spirit, we also drive out demons and, and minister to the sick, etc. So that's that's all that's being said. As far as I know, that's just sound New Testament scholarship. Well, uh, when when I was in seminary, there is a lot of discussion about uh, kenosis, the meaning of kenosis, how far kenosis went, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And... Certainly, when I have explained, for example, uh, example Jesus' statement where he says, um, no one knows the day or the hour, not the angels of heaven, nor, nor the Son, but the Father only, uh, I've talked about the, the fact that there are certain divine prerogatives 
that were by nature the sons that he voluntarily lays aside so as yeah. he can fulfill the purpose of the Father to to be the, the sacrifice and to be the Messiah, so on and so forth. And it almost sounds, and that this is where it bothers me that we can't check what these people's positive beliefs are because we don't know who they are, even though this was republished by somebody else, and I guess we can hold them accountable. But I have to really wonder about their Christology, because it yep. almost sounds like they're saying that if the Son did lay aside any divine prerogatives, which he clearly did in that instance, and certainly, for example, the fact that he is by nature glorious was only manifested on the Mount of Transfiguration. The rest of the time, Jesus didn't walk down the streets of Jerusalem glowing uh, yep. with, the, with the glory of God. Um, it almost sounds like, like they're thinking that's heretical, and it, it makes me wonder you know, where, where they're coming from. But we can't tell because we don't know who it is. Yeah, and, and, and just to add to that, was Jesus genuinely hungry? Or was that just an It says he was hungry. You know, he was sleeping in, in the boat. When he said that he didn't know the, the, the day of his coming, it had to be as a human, because certainly as, as God, he knows all things. So these are just divine prerogatives willingly laid aside for a time. He was always fully God. And on earth, he was fully God joined with fully man, the miracle of the incarnation. Every major doctrinal statement, I know of that, I've been in harmony with for decades, and again, never written a syllable against it or, or spoke a syllable against it. And, and the odd thing is that, that I actually read one website that was getting into kenosis issues, and just about every major evangelical teacher on there was getting bashed for holding to a wrong theology. I thought, yikes, that's, that's everybody, right. basically. Right. So it's, again, I, I'm, I'm not sure what the critique is there. Now, are there some people that may teach this in some exaggerated way? Could be, but that's what have I got to do with that? Just like you have no, you don't have to defend a hyper Calvinist. You know, that's what are you going to do? <laughs> There's error out there. You do your best to just preach the truth. Uh, that that particular section ended with these words. As we've pointed out before, some of the demons Jesus encountered recognized the deity of Christ in human flesh, but Michael Brown and his Nar Apostle buddies do not. Um, <laughs> I, I I don't. How do you? Other than well, chuckling, well, for, what do you for, say? First thing. We'll, uh, we'll get to the NAR nonsense in, in, in a little while, because I, I want to make sure we go through the doctrinal things. But I've preached for years. Anyone just listen to my series where I taught on angels, demons, and deliverance decades ago, that Jesus was recognized as the Son of God. We know who you are. You're the Son of God. And yet, what he did, the way that he drove out demons was, he said, I do it by the Spirit of God. Those are his words. Luke 4, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach and to set the captives free. Is that real or not? Was he just making up words or was there something that happened because of that? Uh, and why is it that he didn't work any recorded miracles before his baptism and before he said the Spirit of the Lord is upon me? That was the divine time for those things to be released. He said, if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, Matthew 12 and Luke 11, then the kingdom of God has come near you. And, and then, you know, when he's equipping us, what does he say? Luke 24, 49 and Acts 1, 8, wait for the Spirit, and, and through the Spirit, you can now bear witness, and the Holy Spirit will bear witness through you. So the same Spirit that was upon Jesus that raised him from the dead has been poured out on the church. Wouldn't we all agree that we preach the God? Let's forget healing and, and demon, demons and stuff like driving out demons. Wouldn't we all agree that when we preach the gospel, we're preaching it by the power of the Spirit? Isn't it the same Spirit that was on Jesus? So again, to me, it's, it's just pretty simple. I don't, I don't know what the dispute is there. To me, to me, it's people looking for something to hang their hat on and not having anything, which is why that the hat keeps falling to the ground. Yeah, we'll get to the NIR stuff later, but it does it does fit in with the idea that as long as there's one phrase or or any way you can make a connection, these folks will make the connection. Whether it's a valid connection is is irrelevant. And one of the reasons I'm sensitive to that is it's it's done to me all the time. It, it, yeah. It's it's an everyday uh, event. Uh, a lot of these people just these people just cannot make category distinctions, and just are not willing to do so because it it requires uh, intellectual effort that they're just not willing to do. Under false soteriology, now, obviously, we have differences in the area of soteriology, and uh, hyper-Calvinists and people like that, that would, those people who would demand that you believe all five points, 
you're you're lost to begin with uh, from from their perspective. So you don't have to worry about them. And, and hey, that's what I could do about it either. No, and 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 on the other <laughs> side, you know, the the people that say my my God is the devil, uh, they, I can't it's worry a monster, about them. Either. You're not saved. Yeah, that's I, exactly I hate that right. Stuff, but so, I see it too. I see I, it we, too. we we see it all over the place. But here's here's what's said. I, I I had said death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Check. They didn't say anything about that. I guess you're. I guess I guess that's the one point they could go. Hey, my, Michael Brown, one hundred percent on that one. Yay. Absolute necessity of God's grace and salvation, check. Substitutionary atonement, check. Now, I stopped right there for a moment. You went to IHOP and debated Brian Zahn on yeah. that very issue. And we played a, a lot of that on the program, and I did a review of it, and including the section uh, that demonstrated that I, I do live in your head because <laughs> you couldn't help at one point while talking about substitutionary atonement to go, now my friend James White would say, I'm being inconsistent at this point, but I don't yeah, think yeah. I am. <laughs> so you, you always live in my head. That's you, a given. You, you, had a second, you had a second debate going on there while the other debate was going on, which I found to be sort of fun. But, but you've defended uh, substitutionary atonement, which is, uh, look, there's, it's fashionable these days. If you want to be at the at the forefront of uh, of New Testament theology these days, you want to go after penal substitutionary atonement. Um, you're, you're sort of being a throwback on something like this, but you've been consistent with that, and so I put check. Now, obviously, um, uh, people on my side will say, well, if he doesn't believe in limited atonement, he doesn't really believe in that, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But this, this group said, According to Michael Brown, sins being forgiven by Christ and the cross is not good enough. Good enough. Michael oh, Brown gosh. clearly preaches the NAR slash NOLR. I'm, I'm losing track of the acronyms. Gospel, and <sighs> and that's because you say uh, if we believe healing is included in the atonement and is always God's desire for His children, then why do we see so few cancer healings today? And then there's a source given to that. So my assumption is that the assertion is being made that, well, since you believe healing is included in the atonement, then sins being forgiven by Christ on the cross is not good enough. There's got to be something added to that. Now, that, uh, was, that wasn't I, the I position— even, I don't even understand the, the, the logic of the false accusation. Well, uh, we, I mean, I know, I know you're trying to piece it together. Well, okay, but, but, it, it said, it, it, here, we believe that divine healing is also provided in the atonement, and there's a source given to you. Now, now you said that in our debate in, in Spain, and so the idea is, if there's something more than just forgiveness of sins in the atonement, then that means that's not enough, there needs to be something added to that, and therefore you don't actually believe in substitutionary atonement. Yeah, so, so okay, N number one, I've probably written on substitutionary atonement longer than most people have even been aware it's been a controversy because that to me was one of the, the great uh, witnessing tools in reaching my Jewish people, the principle of substitution, going back to the atonement system laid out in the Old Testament and, and the innocent taking the place of the guilty and on and on. And I bring it out from the Old Testament. And, and then the clearest exposition of this anywhere in Scripture, in Isaiah 53, that all of us like sheep have gone astray, each has turned to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And we thought he was dying for his sins. Instead, he was dying for our sins. He is the great substitute. He took our place. I mean, I, I've been shouting that from the rooftop for decades. And, and, you know, reiterate it in the clearest ways by Paul and Jesus saying he's giving himself as a ransom for all. So there was one payment, one payment for sins only, the blood of Jesus on the cross, the perfectly righteous one dying for us, wicked, ungodly sinners, that we through him might have life, period, end of subject. And as you know, I, I believe, not as a Calvinist, but my own beliefs, that Jesus died to make salvation possible for everyone, but to infallibly secure the salvation of all those who believe. And on that second point, we obviously agree. So as to what I believe about healing, look, I, I have a monograph called Israel's Divine Healer. Mm -hmm. It's, it's 80,000 words of text and 85,000 words of endnotes. It, it, it is a, an academic monograph. And I lay out there clearly what, what I believe, that the reason that healing is included in the atonement is because healing is uh, sickness is ultimately in the world because of sin. So by dying for the root cause of all human problems, namely sin, there's healing for the whole person. Some of it we see in this world, some of it we'll see in the world to come. So I don't see healing as something that God does outside of the cross. I see that as another benefit as a result of Jesus dying for our sins. 
the same way someone comes to mental health and peace, they were tormented, and or the same way someone gets delivered from demonic powers. I don't see that as separated from the cross. I see all that as flowing out from the cross, our eternal resurrection and being with the Lord forever and ever with perfect eternal life. I don't see that as separate from the cross. I see it as flowing out from the cross. So to me, it's it's all cross-centered. It's all blood of Jesus centered because he died for our sins. That is the fundamental thing of all. And out of that, there is healing for the whole man. Some of it we experience in this world, some of it we experience in the world to come. What is unorthodox about that for the life of me? I don't know. Well, it seems that after they they quoted what I gave you last, um, you said, it says, he also affirms that Jesus was born again in hell. And it's the same quote from the previous section that you say wasn't you. That's a lie. That is a lie. Whoever yeah. posted that, I just want to say it plainly, because some folks need the fear of God in them, okay? You are lying or you are repeating lies or misinformation. Either someone is doing this with malice or someone is so far off in their understanding that they are willfully misrepresenting. I have never believed it or taught it ever. I have rejected it, renounced it, spoken against it for decades on record. Produce the evidence or publicly repent. For your, I'm, not, I'm fine. I'm blessed by God. But for the sake of those bearing false witness, wake up wake up. Just now, had to get out of my heart. Okay, yep. well, um, let me... Uh, now, now here's, here's where a lot of these people are coming from. They're saying, okay, you can say that you've spoken against this, but if you don't uh, start going after, rather than uh, doing conferences with people who do teach it, then that shows that you really do believe it, even though you say different things in your books. That's almost that's almost the mindset. And in fact, mm -hmm. I, I hate to even give uh, any any credence to the Twitter storm going on right now. But there was a question that was asked, and I'm going to go ahead and 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 use because it, it yeah. fits in right here. Uh, it says, uh, if you do not believe in the canonic Christ, and, and which we were just talking about. Uh, why do your friends that you endorse preach the same thing and emphasize the same thing? For example, Todd White, C. Peter Wagner, Heidi Baker, Bill Johnson, Jack Deere, etc. Now, I'll be honest with you. I don't know what those people teach. That's that I don't spend that, that's not my my area. You would seem to know them be better. Is that something that is cons consistent with these individuals in regards to a kenosis Christology? I've never heard. Well, first, uh, I've never met Todd White. We were just at the same conference, but didn't meet. I've never heard him preach or listen to any of his messages. So I have no comment there. See, Peter Wagner, uh, I don't know. I mean, he's the, uh, I, the, the head of what would be called the NAR in the technical sense. So I was, I was never part of that in, in any official way or in a, a meeting, you know, presided over by him or anything like that. But if he, if he, he had, he had certain things I agreed with in terms of uh, apostolic movement today and other things I disagreed with. Um, that's why I was never part of anything formally in that regard. But does he teach differently? Than I, I don't know. I, I'm not aware of, of any of these folks teaching differently. I'll, I'll tell you this. If I knew that, that I was going to be at a conference and people were publicly at that conference going to say that, that Jesus died in hell— and was born again there, either I wouldn't be part of the conference, or if I found out it was done, I would publicly renounce it at that same conference and then talk to the people privately. But I'm not aware. I, I'm not expert. But I mean, here, just, just and as an example, that statement, people that I endorse, right? right. So I, I'm not speaking against Todd White. I'm not speaking for Todd White. I don't know Todd. I never said a word about Todd. How did I endorse him? I've always said I have some areas of agreement with, with Dr. Wagner, the late Dr. Wagner, and areas of disagreement. How did I endorse him? So just, just the first two on the list, again, it's not sloppy. It's false witness. Well, here's, here's the thinking. Here's, here, this, is, this, is extre this is central to almost everything that is being said here, and that is you have a responsibility from their perspective. Um, to check out everyone who is going to be at any conference you're going to be speaking at. Mm -hmm. And in, unless you cross the T's and dot the I's with everybody, by being there, you are endorsing all the theology that can be put together from every speaker. That, that's the understanding. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, I've spoken quite a few years at the the Southern Evangelical Conference, uh, the the Apologetics Conference, probably the biggest one in America every, every year. And you've got, I don't know, 50 more speakers. It could be from William Lane Craig to Josh McDowell, you know, well-known mm-hmm. apologists like that. And my friend, Dr. Frank Turek is a regular speaker. Uh, they had a speaker this last year that's Catholic. Uh, they had another speaker that's young earth creation, another speaker that's old earth creation. So <laughs> what, what do you then do? You don't participate in any way because there might be a speaker there with a different theology on, on a particular issue. Uh, I, I mean, if, if here, here's my problem. The folks that are campaigning for this, if this is how they do their homework, then then it's it's worthless because their homework is is utterly worthless. Here, so let's take Heidi Baker. In my entire life, I spoke at one conference with her in Germany, and uh, I read her book, Birth in the Miraculous, which I found to be an excellent book, very inspiring for for prayer and deeper communion with the Lord. And I had her on my radio show once. Okay, I've never public. I've never endorsed something that she's written or anything like that. And we we've spent time in fellowship together, maybe couple hours total. That was in the the Germany conference. Now, I'm not saying this to speak negatively of Heidi. All I'm saying is, how is it now that whatever she says or does in any meeting anywhere that I'm responsible for? Or conversely, that whatever I say or do in any meeting for somewhere, she's responsible for. You, You talk about people forgetting what Jesus said about having a beam in their eye and looking for a speck. They're looking, in terms of charismatic issues, fine, we'll differ on those. But the, the lies and the misinformation, that's the spec, uh, what they're looking for. The, the beam is the fact that they're lying and bearing false witness. If this is how they do their research, their police work, I, I really fear for them. Well, the, I, the, whole, the whole approach, it's, it's very easy to see uh, in, in this group. The whole approach is... Um, uh, I'm not sure what percentage of these folks would would just be honest to come straight out and say uh, that they they really question uh, whether any meaningful percentage of the charismatic community as a whole is saved. And therefore, um, there's no reason to make distinctions between mm-hmm. people. there's and and that means you can just throw everybody into the same the same bucket. And yeah. therefore, if you you've got a conference uh, a couple days ago, uh, people started tweeting and, and posting that you're going to a conference, I think, in Toronto or someplace. I forget where it was. Yeah, in, in April. Uh-huh. In, yeah, yeah, in April in Toronto. And they're saying, see, this person, this person, this person, this person believes this and that person believes that. And this just all proves uh, what Michael Brown believes, because the idea is, hey, if you're going to the conference, then you believe everything that everyone at the conference is teaching. Now, they don't do that at our conferences. Um, they, you know, we can have uh, amillennialists and postmillennialists and premillennialists and panmillennialists and pedo baptists and credo baptists, and we can have people have all sorts of different perspectives on different things. Those things are safe things to be disagreed about from their perspective. But these things aren't safe things to be disagreed about. And so we're not going to make distinctions, and we're not going to uh, do anything like that. We're going to just just throw you all into one big lump, and therefore you're responsible for, for whatever yeah, anybody yeah. believes. That's yeah, how it works. Let me say a couple of things. One is, I'm unashamedly Pentecostal charismatic. I speak in tongues. I believe the gifts and power of the Spirit are for today. I, I, I believe the gift of prophecy is for today based on Scripture. I, I believe that God heals the sick today in a way that we can look to and expect based on Scripture. And if someone wants to reject me over that, no problem. And and do I consider Mike Bickle a friend? Yeah, sure. And and uh, to the folks speaking at the Toronto conference, as, as far as I know, most of the main speakers, do they hold to orthodox evangelical theology? As far as I know, yeah. Now, I may be mistaken on some, but as far as I know, yeah. And Heidi Baker has a PhD in systematic theology from a from a university in England, for whatever that's worth, just for the, you know, for the <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a in. good or a bad so thing. I, I, yeah. I have no problem whatsoever if someone says, well, we just, you know, if you speak in tongues, if you believe in the gifts for today, you're not safe. Okay, I feel bad for them, but I'm not, I'm not going to deny believing in any of that, okay? So when I deny, you know, involvement in the NAR, I'm a secret apostle, I don't deny it because it's not true. You know, every single day, 
or virtually every day, I get blasted by someone online for being paid for. I'm paid by the Zionists. I'm a Zionist shill. Uh, you know, I constantly, constantly. And then you get from when you're addressing uh, gay issues, well, you're a, you're a closeted gay. You get hit with that all the time. And then, you know, whatever it is, you get hit with these lies. So this is another set of these lies. You're the secret apostle of the NAR and you're denying it. No, I'm not denying it. It's not true. There's nothing to deny. It's just utter falsehood. But the things I believe, I believe, sure, if we want to differ on those, if you're, if you're, listeners and viewers say, well, look, if you're charismatic Pentecostal, I don't think you're saved. All right, read, read my authentic fire book. See the scriptural evidence I present. Look at my respectful interaction with those I differ. And if you still feel that way, hey, I feel bad for you, but we'll, we'll catch up in heaven. That's fine. Uh, so I don't deny believing in any of those things. Great. But the things I don't believe, I, I don't believe. And the, the, you know, again, to hold me responsible for everything everyone does, I found it odd that R.C. Sproul so clearly came out against dispensationalism in his writings and yet was, you know, partners together with John MacArthur, that would be inconsistent based on the same separate and exclude those you differ with mentality. Let's let's get to the NAR stuff in just a second, but there was one other area uh, I wanted to touch on, um, and that was in the area of scriptural sufficiency. Um, yep. Now, let, let me just add, you know, we didn't talk about this beforehand, but let me just, because this is, we ended up sort of discussing this and started touching on this in one of the two debates in uh, in Spain. Um, is there, in your understanding, anything that is theanustos in the possession of the Church that is uh, normative for every believer outside of Holy Scripture? No, nothing. No, 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 no book, no tradition, no alleged revelation. The Bible is the one and only. There's only one thing in the world that is God's Word, capital W, that is binding for all believers, that is God's Word to all humanity. That's the Bible, period, end of subject. Anything that anyone tries to add to that, be it a Book of Mormon, be it, you know, God showed me additional truth today beyond Scripture, or our tradition is sacred to me, any of those beliefs are to be categorically rejected. So any uh, anyone who, who, who says... Um, God has revealed X, Y, or Z to me, X, Y, and Z is always subject to the higher authority of Scripture as its final touchstone. Oh, yeah, uh, of course. If someone said the Lord has revealed to me that there, there are four deities in the Godhead and, and, you know, we should be polytheists, and so they're, they're heretics. If someone said the Lord, well, the Lord revealed to me that I haven't been kind to my fellow workers at my job, I'd say, oh, it could well be, you know, uh, it could be, you have been a little nasty. <laughs> that has nothing to do with someone saying that they have further truth, you know, for the body beyond Scripture. So anything that contradicts what's written in Scripture, we reject. I don't care what miracles or signs it comes with. If it's contrary to Scripture, we reject it. If it claims to add to Scripture, we reject it. We view that as utterly heretical. Okay. Now, uh, that seems rather orthodox to me. Um Let's talk a little bit about this um, this uh, this secret life you've been you've been leading. I'm sorry, Michael. It's it's just time to to get it all out there in the light. Um, uh, in fact, even your wife isn't aware of this, but um, evidently you are the leading apostle of the new apostolic reformation. <laughs> now, now I'm I'm a little surprised by this because I have a book over here. Your commentary is so big, I can't get it out. I I happen to pick up a book a while back called A New Apostolic Reformation, A Biblical Response to a World, Worldwide Movement. Um, and I thought, oh, well, this, this, looks, like, uh, this looks like a fairly, fairly uh, you know, in-depth work here. Let me look at Michael's name up. And somehow you are so good that so even, good. Though, even though you're the chief apostle, you don't even show up in the book. I don't know how you're yeah. doing this. This is pretty impressive. Well, I find more impressive the fact that you are the number one ambassador for the Jesuit movement in the Catholic Church, well, and that you and the Pope Skype on a daily basis, and right. you've been able to hide that from yeah, the general that's, public. That's true. I, I do. I'm pretty good at that, so I, I can see how you got away.